All right, let's dive right in. Today, we're gonna to crack open the statistician's toolbox. We're gonna to look at two major types of tests that researchers use to make sense of all the data in health studies. They're called parametric and non-parametric tests. And trust me, knowing the difference isn't just for scientists in a lab, it's absolutely key to understanding how we prove a medical breakthrough is the real deal. So let's start with the big question, right? When you hear about a brand new drug or some exciting new therapy, how do we actually know it works? How do we know it's better than what we were doing before or even better than doing nothing at all? It's definitely not just a gut feeling. The answer is all about rigorous, careful testing. And choosing the right statistical tool for that test, that is one of the most important steps in the entire process. First up, let's talk about the parametric standard. I want you to think of these as the precision tools in our kit. We're talking about a surgeon's scalpel here, something designed for a very specific job. When you use them under the right conditions, they are incredibly powerful and pinpoint accurate. So what makes a test parametric? Well, it all boils down to one critical word, assumptions. A parametric test doesn't just look at your numbers, it assumes your numbers are playing by a certain set of rules. It's built on the idea that your data comes from a population that behaves in a predictable way. Okay, so what are these rules? Well, the most famous one, the big kahuna, is that the data should follow a normal distribution you know, that classic bell curve shape. The data also needs to be continuous, things you can actually measure, not just categorize, like blood pressure or body weight. And on top of that, the groups you're comparing should have a similar spread of data. And you generally need a decent sized group of people for the math to really work. And here it is, the ideal world, a perfect bell curve. You know, if we measured the height of thousands and thousands of people, this is basically what it would look like. Most of us would be clustered right there around the average in the middle with fewer and fewer people at the super tall or super short ends. It's clean, it's symmetrical, it's predictable, and this perfect world is exactly where parametric tests shine. But we don't live in a perfect world, do we? The reality of health research is, well, it's often messy. So what happens when our data breaks the rules? What happens when it just refuses to cooperate and fit into that neat little box? This is a challenge that researchers face all the time. So instead of that perfect bell, real-world data can often look more like this. It's skewed with this long tail stretching out to one side. Just imagine a study on a new drug. Maybe most patients get a little bit better, but a handful of them have these amazing off-the-charts results. Those few incredible outcomes can pull the whole average way over, creating this exact shape. And suddenly, that precision scalpel we talked about, it might not be the right tool for the job anymore. So where does all this messiness come from? Well, in health studies, there are a bunch of common culprits. You might be studying a rare disease, so you only have a small group of patients. Or maybe your data isn't even a precise number, but a ranking, like a patient's pain level, mild, moderate, or severe. Then you've got outliers, that one patient whose test result is just wildly different from everyone else's. And some things, like how long people stay in a hospital, are just naturally skewed. All of these situations can blow those parametric assumptions right out of the water. So what do you do when your data is a mess? You don't just give up, you reach for a different kind of tool. And this is where we meet the hero of our story, the non-parametric alternative. If parametric tests are the scalpel, think of these as the all-purpose tools. You know, like a Swiss army knife. They're built for the real messy world. And the magic of these tests is right there in the name, non-parametric. They do not make those same strict assumptions about how your data is shaped. That's why you'll often hear them called distribution-free tests. They just don't care if your data fits into a perfect bell curve. They can still get the job done and get it done right. So how do they pull this off? It's actually a really clever trick. Instead of looking at the exact values of the data, they focus on the ranks. Check this out. We've got five patients with different pain scores. Instead of analyzing the numbers, two, nine, or four, the test just asks, okay, who had the lowest pain? Who was next? It turns all the values into a simple order, first, second, third, and so on. It's a brilliant move because it makes the test way less sensitive to those crazy outliers we talked about. And the process itself is pretty straightforward. Step one, you line up your data from smallest to largest. Step two, you assign a rank to each point. Now, what if you have a tie, like the two patients here who both scored a four? No problem. You just average the ranks they would have taken up. So instead of one getting rank two and the other rank three, they both get 2.5. Simple. 
Then you do all your statistical analysis on those ranks, not the original scores. It's a really elegant way to handle unruly data. So we've got our precision tools and our all-purpose tools, our scalpel and our Swiss Army knife. This brings us to the million-dollar question for any researcher. Which one do I use and when? Let's break it down into a super clear, practical guide. This right here, this is your cheat sheet. Honestly, this is the main takeaway. Is your data beautifully bell-shaped, continuous, and you've got a big sample? Go for it, use the powerful parametric test. But is your data skewed? Or are you working with ranks? Or do you have a really small sample size? Then the non-parametric test is your safer, more reliable choice. It's all about matching the tool to the job at hand. If you want to boil it all down to one core difference, it's this. Parametric tests analyze the mean value of the data, the average, and we know that one extreme outlier can pull that average way off course. Non-parametric tests, because they use ranks, are basically analyzing the median, the true middle value. This makes them much tougher, much more robust when the data is messy. Now there is a trade-off. If the assumptions are met, parametric tests are generally a bit more powerful, a little better at finding a true effect if one exists. Okay, I know this can all seem a bit technical, a bit in the weeds, but why does this choice really matter in the grand scheme of things? Well, the implications are actually huge. It's about everything from sound science to public trust. Because using the wrong tool for the job can lead a researcher to a completely wrong conclusion. It could mean they miss a new drug that actually works, or even worse, it could make them think a treatment is effective when it isn't. This isn't just a simple math mistake. It undermines the entire scientific process and can have very, very real consequences for patient health. And hey, this isn't some radical new idea. This quote from a classic textbook on biostatistics just nails it. It says that the strict validity, the truthfulness of our scientific conclusions hinges on respecting these assumptions. The rules are there for a reason, to make sure that when a scientist says, we found something, that claim is built on a rock-solid foundation. So the next time you see a headline about some amazing new medical breakthrough, take a moment. Think about the science behind it. The story isn't just about the results, it's about the methods. And a huge part of that method is choosing the right tool to separate a true discovery from just random noise. Which leaves us with a really important question. How can we be sure that the researchers are using the right tools to find the truth 